Okay, that's the go ahead. So this afternoon, um, right after the post or during the post lunch slump, um, I'm actually going to try and push some of this back to you. Um, do a bit of a practical workshop, go through some of the practical approaches, um, but as well as taking questions and listening um, to the room about what uh, the needs that you have uh, for some of these tools and, and to do some uh, social media and web archiving. Um, so this afternoon session will cover some of those tools that you've already heard about. So I'm going to start with some of your very... Um, I'm going to start with an overview of some of the methods and practical things to think about when um, doing web and social media archiving sort of on an individual or small scale level uh, and then go into a, a couple of say tools lightly. One of them is a real tool. One of them is um, an approach you can take for just sort of very quickly grabbing some of your um, social media content. Um, and then um, Anissa is going to level us up and do a proper um, overview of Web Recorder, which she talked about um, in conjunction with the project that she um, ran collecting digital posters. Um, and then as the last parlor trick of the, of the day, we have um, the two creators from um, George Washington University who helped develop the social feed manager tool, which you've also seen mentioned today. So you'll actually get to see under the hood and see how that ticks. So uh, approaches and tools. I just want to start out because I think it's an important place to start, especially when you have s archivists, curators, um, even creators, researchers in the room, to start articulating why you want to do web and social media archiving. Um, not because I think you might not really want to, and I'm trying to convince you, but just trying to articulate that is really a good basis to start from in any strategy or trying to develop an approach or choose what tools you're going to use. Um, so first response session of the day. Um, what do you think? Why are some of the reasons people in the room are interested in, in archiving web and social media content? No wrong answers. Okay, Tim, you can go first. Oh, we've got a mic coming. Because for my institution, we have a, mm, quote, statutory mm, slash regulatory requirement to capture the records of the governmental institutions of Scotland or the public authorities of Scotland and their public pronouncements on uh, platforms other than the web, um, in my view, and I think others' views as well, constitute such records. So we kind of have to at some w in some way yeah. now there's obviously a, a fuzzy line there right so this might but so yeah we need to do something yeah so web and social media archiving might fit into an existing collecting policy or or sort of mandate for your institution Aaron um i would argue that it's really important to collect social media content uh to ensure that we can document contemporary communicative practices between people um, and the complete change in the way that people engage with each other and create communities online. Right, so we're, it's not just about the content, it's about documenting how the interaction between the technology and the users is changing and, yeah, and creating new types of interactions. And yeah. 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 That would be an important part of the record for us as well. Maybe not just you. Why do you think, in general, it's important um, to capture this type of of content in particular? Um, I guess I'm I'm sort of a community practitioner and researcher, and um, for me, it's because the sort of communities I participate in um, have no other traces. Um, so it's it's a sort of um, I guess effective and necessary um, thing to do. So it is the only record of this community's sort of interactions. Um, else? Um, for us it's mainly two things. Uh, to keep transparency because uh, in the idea that more and more information that the EU gives to the citizens is only online. So and then we change it and it's not there anymore. Uh, so imagine Brexit. 
uh, but will go <coughs> away. So that's why we want to keep it accessible and that's why we want to make yeah. our web archive open as well. Okay. So whether we want to remember or not. I'm sorry? No, carry on. Sorry, I didn't mean <laughs> to interrupt. And uh, the second point is that we see it as part of the EU heritage, cultural, historical, social, etc. And that's also why we want to keep a trace of it. Yes, yeah, so that's increasingly an important cultural uh, record that will make up kind of the the body of um, resources that researchers look to in the future to piece together um, kind of an idea of where it all went wrong, <laughs> um, of what society was like now and how we got here. Nicola? Uh, because it's ephemeral, so we've already seen some of these platforms come and go. Friends Reunited is um, an example, and um, we, we think that Twitter and, and Facebook, for example, are pretty stable, but they are corporates, and so they're um, not necessarily going to be around forever in the form that they are around in. Yes, yeah, so I've um, sort of put this argument forward before because um, often web archiving exists in a slightly different space, a slightly different journal, slightly different uh, Twitter hashtag, slightly different conferences, and digital preservation um, does, and bringing them together uh, sometimes requires explanation. But I think because of that ephemeral nature of websites, by definition, web archiving is an intervention to ensure that digital content that otherwise would disappear is captured and it, it is preserved. So those, I think, are, you know, at least cousins, if not um, siblings. Um, so those are all really good answers. These are just a few I jotted down previously, but I think we've more or less um, addressed all of them. Um, but just a couple that weren't explicitly stated is how often web and social media content are important contextual information or supplement other records that otherwise it's very difficult to make sense of them if you don't have a way of tracing um, the context that they existed in, what was happening in the news or um, what you know, what events led up to this particular thing happening or, or um, occurring. And also, perhaps we just don't have the right sector in the room, but how often web or social media content is used increasingly as evidential value um, is also important. So that's just to get you engaged and start getting everyone's brain in the right place and thinking about, you know, that we're about to talk about how we might go about doing this. Um, and making those decisions should really be based on having a good grasp on why you are doing it. So one uh, important point that I think gets lost in the confusion of the technical challenges of web and social media archiving is that you're still archivists, you're still curators. So web and social media content are not exempt from the same selection and appraisal um, approaches that you use with other types of digital or analog content. Some of the differences might be is that at scale, there's so much web and social media content compared to other forms of content. You want to look to automation. Um, we have heard about some of the automation techniques used at the British Library. Um, so it's important to start thinking about what your priorities are and what elements of web and social media content that are unique um, to web and social media uh, that are important to what you want to collect. So is the look and feel of a website important to your, your users? Um, is that the actual browser platform version, do you need to not just capture the content, but you need to capture the version of the browser, you need to capture somehow to communicate um, the actual technology that was used to create and to present something at the time that it was published or created? Is it important to be able to access this content on different devices? Um, is this primarily accessed um, by users and creators on, say, um, iPads or tablets or on phones? And is that important? Um, or is it just the information inside the content that you need? Is it important for it to be machine readable? Are you one day imagining having users that might want to do a little bit of quantitative analysis on this or compare it to other things using um, software, using uh, computational methods. Um, and also thinking about the relationship of what web content you might want to collect in relation 
to all the other things it's connected to. So I think Anissa's um, case studies of the sort of po graphic events, the memes and the, p the digital posters are kind of an extreme example of this, but you need all of them or a lot of them to show what the event looks like and what it really means and what its purpose was at the time that it was happening or occurring. And that is true to some extent with most web content is that the images that are, are embedded or events or real world things that it's responding to might be necessary to really understand the meaning and significance of that content. And transparency, so this is something um, that I hadn't thought about until researching for the Preserving Social Media um, report is how much the technologies that are available shape the content that's being shared and to think that through and to make sure you're recording that in documentation so that users in the future understand the context and the environment that these things were created in. Um, so one extreme example um, is when Twitter was only 140 characters. So that shapes how people share things. It explains why we have things like Bitly and other shortened URLs. It explains why people use sort of shortened, shortened versions of words, and it, it helps give context to why certain digital um, web and social media content looks and acts the way that it does. And given that these platforms and technologies shape the content that's being created, the archiving tools that you use will also leave an impression on that content that you're archiving. So being clear about what methods and tools you're using, what the limitations are, um, what might not be obvious to users in the future about what they're actually looking at in this archived form. So again, thinking about what you're collecting and why. What is the function of it? Who does it belong to? Um, what is its context? Um, and so just to compare um, very different types of digital, um, of web and social media content. Um, this is an example of an artwork created um, on Instagram, um, and it can be found in, in Rhizome's art base um, archive by an artist called Amalia Ullman. And so this artwork is really dependent not just on Instagram uh, on a platform, but on this version of Instagram, how it looks, how she used the color scheme. Um, so all of those elements are, are relevant. So this needs to be captured um, in its environment. It needs to be captured on this version of Instagram. And then you have more organizational web content, which is again, different. So I've got the DPC website. So that's our institutional not-for-profit sort of uh, homepage, but it is also a really rich resource of reports and um, guidelines and webinar recordings. Um, so it, it, it has several behaviors that might complicate how you decide what to collect. Um, we also have associated social media. We are a community organization, so we're very active on, on Twitter and Instagram um, and all the rest. Um, so you can see that there are different parts, um, different types of web content out there that sort of make up what the DPC's sort of institutional web content might be. And then another example of um, We Are Transmission, uh, which is a group of um, archivists and curators who are interested in ensuring that the, um, the archives of African diaspora communities are preserved. So you've got sort of multiple contributors um, again, it's uh, it's sort of an activist group as well, so they have social media as well. And so thinking about why you want to collect these and what they're made up of um, is important before you start launching out into different tools um, and choosing your strategies. So what are some of the challenges specifically for social media? Um, and just to say that increasingly the line between the web and social media is very blurry. Um, despite the title of this talk, um, I think it's, it's not necessarily useful to distinguish between the two um, because social media is web-based. Um, and you will increasingly see, um, as we've already seen, the evolution of the technologies used to develop the web and that will just continue to evolve. So while you know, there are some differences between how uh, social media acts and what the complications might be, to archiving it, for instance, that it's user-generated um, information, um, that that line is blurry and that some of these issues you, you do need to consider with other types of web content that you might label as social media.
<coughs> so one of the issues um, Anissa has already pointed out uh, is that social media is a conversation. Um, and just full disclosure, I'm not the first person to say that. I think I got that from an article by Helen Hugh, uh, who used to work for the, uh, the British Library on the UK Web Archive. Um, but I do think it helps you think about why it's a challenge to select and appraise social media is because there are so many different users that are involved um, who might be using different social media services and cross-linking and trying to isolate where your object or your collection starts and stops um, is complicated by that. Also, all of the embedded media, we've talked about the limitations a lot of these um, archiving tools have for collecting audiovisual material, um, moving images, as well as URLs. What are you going to do about URLs embedded in social media? Are you going to archive all of those URLs as well so that when you have the social media post, it will link out to the archive version that was more or less the same as when that social media post was made? Or do you just sort of rely on it being available on the live web or if it disappears? Tough. Other complications that have been mentioned that people don't consistently use hashtags. So that's not necessarily a reliable way of capturing all the relevant social media content you might want. There are simply spelling errors. People spell things wrong, so their tweets aren't included in a keyword search. Um, talked about the, the shortened links. Do you just leave them as they are, or do you make sure that you pull those out, extract them, um, and link to, to, to the live web or, or to an archive version of that? Um, how important is it for the meaning of those social media posts? Deciding what's relevant. You know, Twitter is open to the public. Um, you know, different people may seem to be discussing the same thing, but it turns out they're completely uh, different. So deciding um, what's relevant and how you make that judgment and rights and ownership. And I will come back around to some of the sort of legal and, and regulatory issues around web and social media archiving. Um, but as has been mentioned, these are um, the words and expressions and creations of individuals who are not necessarily um, professional publishers who recognize themselves as such. Um, and it complicates not just the legal approach to what um, you can capture, um, but what the ethical, uh, ethical sort of codes um, and what sort of um, ethical considerations you need to think about uh, before selecting uh, content to archive. So like I promised. <laughs> so ownership and intellectual property, um, you know, that can affect a lot of different content because it's individuals creating um, and sharing things that they own and that they've created. Um, but one sort of greater sticky complication, particularly with social media, but also with other forms of web content, um, is data protection uh, and privacy. So it's taking into consideration, you know, on the one hand, things like GDPR and um, legal regulations that govern individual privacy, but actually thinking about while these might be rich, important resources to have uh, collected and, and in archives, um, making sure that you understand the full repercussions of having those available um, or captured in an archive and to what extent these people are aware, users, individuals represented in websites and social media platforms understand that their content might be captured in an archive. And then particularly for social media and one major uh, restriction um, to archiving social media content are the platform terms and conditions that govern um, how you can use and access information on Twitter and Facebook um, and Google's platforms um, and all the ones that I'm sure my younger siblings all use and I've never even heard of. So um, some of the generic types of policies you might see with social media um, are the terms of service, which govern how you can use the platform, the user agreement, which is kind of more about what the platform promises the user. Um, so Twitter, for instance, promises users that if you delete a tweet or you change or delete your account, no one will ever be able to access that deleted content again, which of course as an archivist you're like, hmm. Um, so that can cause some problems as well. Their privacy policy, again, um, linking to what they've agreed um, to protect uh, for their users. Um, and then the sort of all-important developer agreement or developer policy, it's, it's sort of worded differently platform by platform. But this one can be very restrictive if you're trying to use a tool that pulls from a platform's API. 
So those application programming interfaces are a way of just extracting the data itself. So you're not trying to copy it using a Heratrix crawler. Um, you're actually sort of getting the source code that's full of metadata. And while that's a fantastic archival format, it is tightly governed by these developer agreements um, because they want to ensure that they can protect um, and, and control who has access to user content, mainly because they can sell it. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. <coughs> uh, and the one issue that has been, um, I think, contentiously discussed and no absolute decision ever made is while you may be able to navigate the terms and conditions of platforms in order to find a way forward to archiving and sharing social media content, you have to decide within your own organization if these platform legalities are good enough and do they protect users well enough particularly as curators or archivists, you have a knowledge of the communities that you're archiving and of the people that are represented in these collections and making a decision about whether um, just obeying sort of the legal requirements fulfills your obligation to protect them uh, and to respect them as individuals. So yeah, I realize I didn't just present an answer, but it's just to make sure um, you're thinking about that as well. Um, and this is not... Um, Sorry, I don't know why I keep crackling. Um, not to say that you shouldn't, that um, you should completely put on the brakes, but simply to think about it and make sure you're being transparent and stating to users um, what your ethical policies are about collecting web and social media content that might contain individuals' um, creations and created generated content. So in terms of the long-term preservation, as a digital preservation person, um, what are the concerns that I recognize in this? Um, and some of these have already been mentioned today. So with, with web content, you find fairly often, as has already been mentioned, that the website for a community group or its Facebook group and content might be the only record. And that's not just true for small community groups, it's true for big institutions as well how often um, institutions, universities, government bodies will publish reports um, or prospecti or, or official documents um, on their website and not archive them anywhere else. So fairly often it might be the only record um, of an important event um, or document. And it might similarly be the only copy of an image or of uh, some other type of embedded file. Often, um, in eagerness to uh, keep up with new technology and have the newest, shiniest, most usable website, um, updates and migrations can cause broken links um, and can sort of shroud or um, change information um, that was previously available. And if you haven't captured different versions um, of that web content, um, there might be no going back. Th similarly, new technologies emerging and replacing older ones, making it more difficult to access and use older content. And it is not necessarily an obligation for creators of websites to archive their own web content. Uh, for social media as well, um, it's important to think about this content. Um, while it seems easily accessible, you can pick up your phone and just go to your your Facebook app or your Twitter app or your Instagram app and view it, it is vulnerable to loss. No one has promised they're going to archive these. And in the terms and conditions of most social media platforms, when you click that your user, they many explicitly say they are not responsible for maintaining access or, or for preserving this content. So they have no legal or regulatory requirement to preserve uh, content on that website or on that platform. Um, changes in platform policies and ownerships change quite frequently, um, which is a challenge for archives because um, you may create or, or start down the road of a particular strategy that relies on the, the policies um, being a certain way, um, come to find them change and have to rethink the strategies. Um, also, historical data is less commercially um, uh, valuable to these platforms. So through data resellers, um, so for instance, Twitter's data resellers, GNIP, you can purchase, often for exorbitant amounts of money, old data. So even if you didn't capture it at the time, 
I'm sorry, the tech people are looking at me. Is there something I can do for the <laughs> Sorry, okay. I'll try putting the pen down and see if that works. Oh no, I'm still. Um, but even these data resellers can only um, sell you this data if they have it themselves. And the older data uh, becomes, the less valuable it is for them to sell it for uh, things like consumer analytics. Um, <laughs> And it is expensive for them to curate and store this <laughs> information. <laughs> yeah, I'll switch to one of the handheld mics. Sorry, everybody. I'm not a good, very good Britney Spears. Oh, am, I, am I not on yet? Testing, yeah, okay. Right, so we've seen examples of this already um, with GeoCities in 2009 uh, shutting down um, with the loss of lots of user-generated content. Uh, TwitPic, which was shut down by Twitter um, based on a change to their terms and conditions in 2014. Um, that content was, they did reach an agreement um, with a sort of independent archiving um, group and that data was eventually saved. Um, uh, but is now significantly less accessible. And as was already mentioned, um, Flickr has announced they will be restricting their free storage for users um, and any users that have content in excess of the new restricted limits will lose their photos. <coughs> so we've talked about sort of approaches um, and why we go about doing web and social media archiving and what to think about and some of the challenges. Um, so, you know, we go back to our institutions, we go back to our, our desks, and how do we actually do web and social media archiving, particularly if you don't have the infrastructure of a big organization behind you? Um, so just to do an overview of some of the main approaches, um, we've heard um, about web crawlers, Heratrix being um, sort of one of the main big uh, open source um, web crawling technologies um, that creates uh, work files. Um, platform self-archiving services, which is one of the techniques I will walk you through. Um, this is some of the platforms provide some limited um, abilities and functions to download your own social media content. Um, the API-based tools, we talked about Social Feed Manager, um, but there are lots and lots of API-based tools out there that will capture um, data directly from the platforms through their APIs. Um, and for some organizations who um, have this in reach, there are third-party services um, set up who do social media archiving. Um, so there is a market for that as well, as well as I've mentioned these data resellers who, um, just to say I've mentioned them because you can get data from them, um, but their set up, their business model is to sell data um, to big corporations. So I, I think their main client list are sort of big Fortune 500 companies to do consumer analysis, to sell you things. Um, so this is not necessarily um, a strategy that you should rely on being able to go to one of the data resellers um, and getting data. So first, has anyone ever used HTTrack? Okay, oh, Nicola, yeah. Um, so it would be helpful if you've used it um, to chip in maybe how it actually has worked in real life. Um, I have done some testing on it, but just like any tool, testing it out and learning how it, it reacts in the wild to different um, types of web content in different contexts is really important. So I'll give you a broad overview of what this tool is, what it can do, and what it can't do, and what it looks like. Do we have any techies in the room? So like proper coding, like, okay, there is a command line version of this tool as well. Yeah, Tim just got excited. But I am gonna show you the, the GUI version, um, partially because I am not a super coder IT person, um, and so that is how I've done the tool in the past. And I do think um, when you're showing someone command line, it's really hard to actually show what's happening. So, HTTrack calls itself a website copier, and that is a pretty precise explanation of what it does. So 
what HTTrack does is it downloads a website to a local directory and it calls the same mirror, that it's mirroring the website. Um, so the version that I used for Windows 10 is WinHTTrack and that is good backwards to pretty much all versions of Windows. It's a very robust tool. And there's also a version called WebHTTrack for the Linux Unix environment. And like I said, command line um, is available for all of that. It allows you then to access this downloaded mirror um, of your website, both online and offline. And it also lets you update a mirror. So you can go back in six months, run it again. It will find everything that's changed and update your archived mirrored version. If it's a rather large website or collection of websites, it is possible to pause it and then resume it later. So you don't have to sit down and watch it for six hours. Um, you also can capture the files embedded within a website, um, keeping in mind there are limitations to what it is capable of copying. And then what HTTrack generates then are the HTML files, all the other embedded files, um, and a WHTT file, um, which is this mirror, and it's what you need to be able to update a copy of a website. Um, and then your index.html for sort of review later on. So this works best on simple, what I've described as flat websites. It does not handle big dynamic websites. So it is in increasingly uh, maybe not as useful. But if you have no other recourse for copying an entire website, this is great for just giving a high level copy um, of all of the content that you've put up on a website. So to give an example of a time I used it was working on uh, as a project officer for a big EU funded project. And the web provider um, that ran the website for that project wanted to upgrade um, our content management system. And we'd had uh, complications with them in the past. So to be safe, I wanted to have my own copy of that project website. And it was all fine. There were lots of broken links, but nothing was actually lost. Um, but it is re was reassuring to have this backup while the upgrade was going on. Nicola, when was it, did you test this for a specific use case? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I, I used it a long time ago, and it was um, in conjunction with um, the Pandas uh, software that we were using at the at the time. So we um, invoked the HT track crawler with the Pandas software that was doing sort of automated crawls. But we had the standalone version of HT track. I had what I had it on my desktop, and I could do patch crawling. So if our bulk crawling had missed any objects, I was using the HT track copier to get those files and then upload them into the into the bulk crawls and what was really useful about HT track was it shows you the directory structure of what you're crawling so you can do QA really easily you can look up that particular directory or that particular um, object to see if it has or hasn't been crawled yep and you'll see that kind of in a bit later on in, in this but yeah so just to give you some realistic expectations of HT is great if you want to go home tonight and archive a website, but it does have some limitations. Uh, so if you use HT Track, you know that's a good solution in the interim for now. But you might not be finished with a long-term digital preservation strategy for your for your web content. Um, so you download this um, from the HT Track website. Um, it very handily tells you which one you probably want to download, um, and that's the version for Windows. <coughs> And it's um, a really easy wizard, gets you set up. Um, and honestly, in the configuration process, it's such a straightforward tool um, that you probably will only go astray if you're trying to go astray. So you begin by creating this new project or mirror. Um, and just to say the documentation is one really good. So if you go to HTTrack's website, um, they've got some really great guidance. Um, if what I do today isn't quite enough for you to figure out whether you want to use it or not. But they do interchangeably sort of use the word project and mirror. But as far as I can tell, it roughly means the same thing. So um, you can see here I gave, um, do I have a pointer? 
Yes. So you can see I, you know, you assign it a name. You can create categories if you think you're going to be creating quite a lot of these mirrors um, so that they're easy to categorize and to find. And then you just tell your um, so tell it where you, where you want to store these. So very straightforward. Right. So when you're actually setting up these mirrors, there are just a few components you want to want to think about and go back to this what am I collecting and why question. Uh, so first you want to decide what you're actually telling the crawler, telling HTTrack to select. Um, so the sort of top level um, option, this download um, web, yeah, download websites, it just does what it says. That's when it just goes and it captures the website um, and just copies it. Um, but it does give you a few other options. You can download, for instance, just all of the files that are contained in a website without, con without capturing the entire website. Um, you can add your, um, what Heratrix refers to as in web archiving lingo as your seed URL. Um, so this is the high level addre web address for the website that you want captured. <coughs> um, the other option you have um, in adding your web addresses is to um, insert the credentials for a restricted website. So if you want it to get behind um, sort of a password login, um, you can insert those and send HTTrack to crawl that content as well, if you have permission. Um, but the place you might spend quite a lot of time in HTTrack is, is here. It's setting up your options or your parameters for what you want it to crawl and how. So this is what it looks like. Uh, so this option, the browser ID, I just want to point out one sort of clever uh, function it has is this HTML fitter that lets you embed this little line of code in every HTML file. Um, so you can see here I've entered the version of HTTrack that I used and the date that I crawled it. Um, so if you ever need to go interrogate just those files, there is a way of embedding some metadata into those um, mirrored files. In the log, index, and cache, um, just a few important things you want to make sure are clicked. Um, is this create log files? If you don't have those log files, if you encounter a bunch of errors and there are lots of problems, you have no way of knowing what happened. So that is where you go and, and check and see why certain pages weren't copied correctly. And also making an index um, so that you can go and browse that website online later um, to see how the mirror compares uh, to the live website. Uh, scan rules, so this allows you to deliberately include or exclude certain types of files. Um, so you can see here how you go and um, sort of uh, tell it really specific file types um, that you don't want included. Um, and you can, you can add several of those. So if you don't want any video files or a certain type of video file, you can tell it to not even bother trying to capture those. Limits. This is very important if you don't want HTTrack to try and copy a website for 10 years straight. Um, especially if you're not sure how big a website is or how big files might be that are contained on the website. So for this crawl, you can see I, or mirror, sorry, I have set the mirroring depth to three. So this is also similar if you've heard of the term hops. So this is how many clicks the HTTrack will copy. So Three means it will copy that high level, dpconline.org, plus two clicks away. And I think I mentioned earlier as an example, dpconline.org, our website, has quite a lot of content. So if I just let it go forever, it probably would actually take like 10 years for each to track to crawl the website. You can also limit the overall size that you want the entire copy to be. Um, you can tell it to pause after it finishes downloading this limit. So if you know you have limited disk space and you want to fill it up and then pause and then clear it to sort of backup storage or another form of storage and then continue downloading, you can tell it to do that. You can also limit it by uh, time, uh, by connection speed. So this is just important in terms of controlling um, the mirror or the, or the crawl that HTTrack is doing. Flow control, I love the names of these options, by the way. Um, so this is important um, for when 
HTTrack encounters an error, how long you want it to take trying to resolve that error. So actually, the, the documentation recommends 120 seconds, so two minutes. But that's not an option in the drop-down menu. Um, so I've followed their, their documentation advice, um, not the drop-down menu advice. Um, but that's up to you to, to decide. And then you can also decide how often you want it to retry content that it couldn't get the first time. So I probably wouldn't put 6 million in there um, in case it's just definitely not happening. Uh, so in build, this is what um, Niccolo was talking about with the uh, with HTTrack mirroring the structure of the website in the directories, um, which makes QA a lot easier. So everything in this build tab is, is kind of about what the outcome is going to be and how that looks. So this is where you tell it that you want it to mirror the site structure. But if for some crazy reason you didn't want it to mirror the site structure, so you just wanted all of the files in one folder, you can tell it to do that too. And the other thing that I think is useful is this no external pages, uh, which basically is telling HTTrack that when it presents the mirror, if you click on something in the archived version, the mirror, that has not been copied, it will take you to the live web if it exists there. But if you click this, it will tell you that's what it's doing. Otherwise, you have to sit there and watch, um, watch to make sure that it doesn't flip over to the live web and you don't realize it's not been captured. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Yeah, so in the spider, um, if you don't accept the cookies, it will also limit what um, HTTrack will capture. So then after you've set all of these options, <coughs> again, those options are how you think about, um, it's sort of the curatorial part of deciding what you want to capture. Um, you can either just launch it, um, which is, you know, if it's just a, a small uh, website or small thing that you want to catch, um, you can go ahead and launch it. Uh, but also, if you want to delay it, you can save those settings. You can also give it a time that you want it to start. So this is sort of part of web archiving etiquette, so that during high traffic times, you're not overloading websites. You're not interfering with live users who just want to use that website. So you might set it to start crawling at you know midnight or 2 AM, although maybe that's when a lot of users are actually using websites. I don't know. And while it is copying, you can monitor what's happening. Um, so this was useful um, while I was watching it. It was trying to collect a file. It was really struggling with. It was really holding everything up. And I had put a time limit on it. So I didn't want it to spend lo loads of time loading one thing. So you can skip that um, and maybe go and capture it later. You can also see just in sort of four minutes in, we already have an error. Um, the other thing is you can pause this while it's going on. I think I mentioned that earlier. You can pause a copy while it's happening um, and modify your options. So I had initially set this for 10 minutes and then decided I didn't actually want to sit there for 10 minutes and watch it. So I paused it, went in, and modified uh, the time limit. Um, so that way you can control um, the tool while it's working. Um, and then when the mirror is complete, um, you can view that log file of um, everything that occurred while the tool was running. Sorry, forgot I was using the, the pointer. Um, or you can go ahead and browse the mirrored website on your browser. Right, so just to show some of the things we, we've talked about. So this was the um, log from my um, test. And you can see here quite a lot of 404s. So that was the main error that it ran into. So about a year and a half ago, we. Um, migrated our website and um, upgraded it to a much newer um, web platform. Uh, and this was a big problem, was making sure that all the links were still intact and that things still linked to the right place. So this was not a surprise. Um, and maybe even kind of proud that it wasn't more. So this is what you see in your directory. And it's this index file that you told it to create that allows you to go do some QA against the live website. Um, so you can see here, when you're browsing, this is how it indicates that you're still um, in the archived mirror, and not on the live web. And if you do click on a link, the HTTrack didn't collect 
it still has the URL. It will still take you to that location on the live web, but it tells you um, that that's what it's doing. Otherwise, it just sort of seamlessly takes you there. So what does an error look like? This is a really common um, limitation for HTTrack is it doesn't capture style sheets very well. So this is what the web page looked like. This page is entirely created um, by pulling data from other parts of the website. Um, and HTTrack just didn't really understand that. But it did capture other complex style sheets. So you can see that is a very similar type of page. And it, it did all right with that. So it, it just depends. As I mentioned, the documentation for the tool is really thorough and easily accessible um, and goes into this in a lot more detail than I went into today. Um, also, if you're interested in the command line, there's a really good sort of user guide um, about the use of the command line and, and how to make that work as well as it can. Right. Um, does anyone have any questions about HTTrack before I just launch into the last bit? Uh, oh, well, uh, Helena, since you're near the microphone. Um, when you were doing this test, how long did it take you to do it? Well, so I'd used the tool before, so I sort of reminded myself that bit didn't take very long. Um, from beginning to end, it probably took me about an afternoon. Um, but I was also um, doing it um, in a way that I could remember all of the steps. So it might not take you quite that long. I also wasn't concerned with capturing the entire DPC website. That would have been a much bigger challenge. Does it, uh, on one of the screens it offered you options for um, what it stored or what it did. Is one of those to put it in a WARC file? Just out of yes, interest. The, um, no, sorry. That's a good question I meant to mention. HTTrack does not create work files. Okay. Um, and I did have a look, but for a tool that might be able to convert HTTrack outputs into a work file um, with no luck. So if someone knows about that or um, would like to, to host a hackathon where <laughs> we figure out how to do that, um, would be great. Uh, I don't really know how that would work since the way the work file is created, generated by something like Keratrix. I don't know if there's a way to go backwards to do that, but... else was that Yeah, I, I was just wondering in what kind of format it's saved. Yeah, so it saves all of the HTML files and all of the other content type files that it captures, and then it outputs this .whtt that can be opened and used only by HTTrack. So like I said, this is a good approach that you can learn and do quite quickly, but it is not necessarily the end. Um, you're not necessarily finished with doing the preservation um, once you've captured this content. <coughs> I just want to make it clear, or get clear in my head what you get at the end of it. So you get a you get a file called called a .whtt file, and you can't just execute that and have it run in your browser. You have to run it through HTT track first. Is that the way it works? What your browser opens is that index file, the HTML file that it creates for you. So you do have the HTML files. Um, and you can also tell it to collect all of the documents and images that it collects into separate folders so that you can parse that content and deal with it separately. Is everyone going to go home and try HTTrack? <laughs> so your, your Christmas homework? So when, it, when you do that, it rewrites the URLs inside the pages to point so the, 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 the thing you've got, the blob you've got inside a folder is internally consistent and the index file allows you to browse that as if you were browsing the, the live object, but it's actually moving you around inside the blob that you've grabbed. Okay. And the WTTF thing is all about what 
the crawler would do if you asked it to do it again to track what it got the first time and what has changed the second time. Thank you. Yes, that's the official term is the blob. Right, so just real quickly in my last six minutes, um, I'm gonna walk you through this social media platform self-archiving. So I do this fairly regularly and it's slightly different every time I do it. So I'm gonna give you the general concept and maybe if you weren't aware, let you know that Twitter, Facebook, Google, uh, YouTube, well that's Google, um, allow you to download your own social media content to some different degrees of sophistication. Um, so this is a quick win. This is if you um, realize you definitely need to start pulling this data down and saving it now, this content. Um, something that you can do as long as you are the account owner or have the credentials for the account. Um, so the output varies between platforms. Um, what Twitter gives you is very structured, um, but because it's um, output is in JSON that sort of supports how um, how structured the data is. Um, I think Facebook um, will give you XML um, and Google gives you a whole mess of things. Um, and you can also select from Google where you which Google services you want to export. So you don't just have to export everything you've ever generated on Google. Um, so I will walk you through Twitter because it is the most straightforward uh, of the different platforms self-archiving functions. But I can answer some questions about Facebook um, if, if you want to know more about that. Uh, so it's something that you find in your account settings. Uh, like I said, it's only permitted if you are the account owner or have the credentials to the account. It's good practice for any institution that has one or more public facing um, social media account. And I realize this can be a challenge if an organization um, social media accounts are controlled by say a marketing department um, and not by the archivists. So coordinating and communication, definitely important um, to make sure that you are at least regularly pulling down your own social media content. It's also good practice for your own personal digital archiving. So you see with Flickr, you see with TwitPic, these platforms may change their policies quite quickly and it's much easier um, to collect and archive this data as you go rather than trying to capture your whole 10 or 15 years of social media history all at once um, and make sense of it and do something with it before something changes on the platform. So you navigate to your settings, you just click your little profile picture. This is um, Chrome and it's in this settings and privacy um, option uh, and it's pretty much always been in a category called that so that's remained somewhat um, similar. So this is different, this is not how it used to work but this is how it worked two days ago, um, is you can download through Twitter your Twitter data, um, also if you have a Periscope account you can do that from there. Uh, so when you click that button it generates an archive file um, and it emails it to you. So it doesn't um, sort of download into your browser or anything like that. Um, and it's pretty much instantaneous. So this is my work Twitter account. It's only been open since about 2014. It is most active on days like today and then may go um, days at a time without too much activity. And it took about four minutes for Twitter to email it to me. And it sends you back, Ooh, sorry, it sends you back to Twitter um, and then a download um, that will download into your browser as a zip file. Um, so you have to extract those zipped files. I one time overlooked that it was in fact a zip file and it doesn't work uh, if you don't unzip all of the files. So you can see here generally what you get. Um, it pulls out all of the um, media as it calls within your tweet. So this is all the images that you've um, tweeted or are part of your account, so like your uh, profile photos. It also pulls out any media um, that you have sent, not that has been sent to you, but that you have sent out in direct messages. That's also um, an important, important thing to say, is you do not get the tweets that people tweet at you even if you're mentioned. Um, you do not get replies to your tweets. You only get data that you pushed out. That said, 
in these individual, well, you can't see them here, but in the individual tweet um, uh, JSON code, it will show you that someone replied and it will give you the handle of the person that replied and it will give you a tweet ID that you can use to go find the tweet of the person who replied to you, but it will not let you download it. it won't let you download the tweet content. So if you've never seen behind a tweet, that's what it looks like. Um, so this is an enormous, I think there were thousands of lines. This is um, just Notepad++. It actually um, combined, no, this is all of my tweets. So this is new. It used to give you the option of opening individual tweets, but it has now just combined all of your um, pushed out tweets. Um, so you can see this tweet here um, is a retweet. Um, I'm trying to think of what else might be um, pertinent that will make sense in English. I used the hashtag uh, World Digital Preservation Day 2018, uh, WDPD 2018, which it tells you there um, under the hashtags nest. Um, it was not favorited. <laughs> it was not retweeted. This is a terrible tweet. I should have looked at it more closely before I chose it. But so you can see, um, once you get past this massive file of just code um, of a markup language, um, you can make sense of it. And you, you then, you, ha you have something that can be replayed later. And that's me exactly to time. Um, any questions about the self-archiving function? Tim. Oh, microphone. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Um, are there any ubiquitous tools that will uh, parse that enormous file? Yes. And give you access to the tweets in a way that makes sense as opposed to a way that is structured? Um, yes, I'm, I'm struggling to try and think. A social feed manager might do it for you. Um, yes, there are lots of tools out there. Okay. Um, so many tools <coughs> to the extent that the hard work is going to be fi finding the one that you want out of the many that are available. Right, okay, that's cool. <coughs> Maybe this is maybe this is not the right place for this conversation, but like I do some collaborative stuff with people and we use Google Drives and Google Photos and I saw that you had a Google uh, download function. What's the best way to back up, let's say, a Google spreadsheet? Because I've tried looking that online. It's really hard to find good advice on that. <laughs> right, I would want to go back and see how the Google data um, download works. They are careful about permissions, mm -hmm. so it might be, again, as long as you created the spreadsheet, there might be a way. Um, <coughs> and I'm so tempted to say just pull it down, but I realize you, you lose some of the functionality um, in the spreadsheet itself. I think it was Jenny Mitchum did a blog post 12 months, 18 months, two years ago, something like that, where she tried downloading Google Docs and in different formats and noting how they would rad they some were more or less radically different from the thing that was on the screen when you were editing in Google and that actually there wasn't a format. There just didn't exist a format that got everything that was in the Google Doc in the way it appeared because a Google Doc isn't a document, it's a sequence of edits. And so you, internally it hasn't got a thing like a document, it's got its, its representation structure is completely different. So you have to project that into something and every time you project it, it comes out slightly different. And I imagine that's the same with the spreadsheets, but I've never looked at it. Yeah, I'm sh I think it was Jenny, it might have been somebody else. I think I read the same blog, and I think she said something like, um, you need to capture it in several different ways in order to preserve the one document. To get everything. 
to get everything that you need, yeah. And just to say that can be true of a lot of different websites and things, uh, especially if it's you can view it on your laptop, on your mobile phone, on you know different um, browsers. Um, in some cases, that is important to be able to capture things in different ways. So you've got different avenues in to really represent how that web site or web content was interacted with and used and, and understood. Um, on Facebook, have you tried to download all the, your activity and does that give you the interactions you've had? Yeah, yeah so... Every interaction. Yeah, so when you download it, basically just gives you everything, every like you've done, every and back and forth, anyone who's liked you, or comments from other people, everything. What it doesn't give you are direct messages from other people. So I know Messenger is now kind of a separate app. Um, but the first time I ever downloaded my Facebook data, maybe five years ago, it gave you all of that. And then later, uh, re-downloading it, it gave me the text of direct messages, but not the name of the person who sent it, which is of course a bit weird because it's like, well, I obviously know from context, this is from my mom, duh. Um, and then later, eventually all I could get were my outgoing direct messages. But I've not done it in the past maybe year, so I'm not sure if they've started including, yeah. Okay, with that, I hand over to Anissa to walk us through Web Recorder, which unlike HTTrack, will give you work files and also read work files created uh, from other tools. Is that working? Yeah. Attempt to use my hair to keep it on my head. We'll see how that goes. Right. Um, okay. So, oh, <laughs> okay. I'm going to um, tell you a little about web recorder and then I'm going to gallop through how to use it. Um, I'll just I'll just begin and then we can we can go from there. Um, okay, web recorder is a free open source web archiving tool 
built and developed by Rhizome with the support of the Mellon Foundation. It enables high fidelity captures of web pages including the kind of interactive content which is difficult for traditional web crawlers to capture because, as I said earlier, it requires direct activation by a user. So actions such as scrolling to load or clicking to play cannot, at the moment, um, be mimicked by a crawler. A high fidelity capture is... Um, Sorry, a high fidelity capture is one which can reproduce this complex dynamic content, not only visually but with functional and experiential accuracy. Web Recorder can achieve captures that are truer to the original browsing experience because it is operated by a curator who performs the gestures which bring the web to life. So clicking buttons and links, scrolling, expanding and collapsing dialogue boxes or flicking through images during capture renders those same elements and activities accessible to somebody browsing the web archive. My aim in this session this afternoon is just to give you an overview of Web Recorder's core components. I'll introduce the interface as it is seen by a curator or archivist who collects and by a researcher who explores the web archive. My hope is to speak for around 20 minutes, leaving 10 minutes for, -ish for questions and discussion, as well as potentially some hands-on experimentation with the tool and um, if you're interested, we can continue that in the in the break afterwards. So I'm going to describe or r run through three broad phases of the collecting workflow. Um, capture, review and browse. In the capture phase, a curator defines the seed or start URL from which to explore the web and begins navigating and interacting. In the review phase, a curator's, um, well, the, the review phase as a whole, it is a curator's opportunity to look back upon and if necessary augment what they've captured before preparing the content for browsing, the final phase, the browse phase, by adding description, choosing privacy settings, and devising a system of arrangement that will facilitate and guide somebody who's going to navigate the collection. I'll also introduce one of the modes by which Web Recorder can be browsed offline using the Web Recorder player, which is another free open source piece of software. It's a, a desktop application, also developed by Rhizome and available on GitHub. I'll give you the link as when we get there. Um, so after I've done those things, then I'll open up some discussion. So. so for capture, we'll begin here at webrecorder.io. Enter capture mode simply by, you can see that quite well, okay. Um, Enter the capture mode simply by um, pasting in the URL you want to record, or you want you the pasting in the URL you want to save and clicking start. Notice the pulsing capture button in the top left, and watch the file size counter also in the top left increase as content is captured. You select your pathway, um, and for this demo, I opted to explore the blog, so you can see that all of these are still. This was a, an attempt not to do a disastrous live demonstration, so we're going to do it like this. You can see I clicked on the blog. So um, I scroll down, and I click on this. I'm interested in this announcement about a forthcoming exhibition at the New Museum. 
I'm going to explore that page, scroll right to the bottom. On my way back up, I noticed an article about um, Constant Dull Art and a net artist I'm interested in. So I click, scroll through, then continue exploring. I looked through the first three pages of the blog. You can see in the URL, um, kind of um, the banner where it says current browser, then you see a, a kind of internal banner. You can see um, the URL of my page location, so the third, third page of the blog. Um, I use the back button in my browser to return to the first page of the blog. Oh, I heard uh, Zach Blass uh, speaking at Transmediale this spring, so I'm going to click on that article um, titled Get Off the Internet. I'm going to read the article, remembering to keep an eye on the file size counter, which is increasing in the top left, 23.83 megabytes. Scroll through until I reach the bottom of the page, and the counter has, and I'm, I'm sort of satisfied that that counter has stilled. I'm going to, um, sorry, scrolling um, slowly back up, I decide to follow the link to see the Zach Blass work in Net Art Anthology. I click, scroll down, press play on the embedded video I encounter, decide to click and look at some GIFs. I watch them animate while the web recorder captures their movement and scroll to the bottom of the page. I notice the social media links and decide to look at Instagram. I use the option button, um, three dots in the top right corner. Maybe I should, can you see that? Um, how do we, how do you, um, oh. so three, oh, wait. So yeah, the three dots in the top right hand corner there. Um, I use the option button there. So sorry, I have shown you already. Option button, three dots on the top right to turn auto scroll on. I watch the page roll. The posts are flickering into being until I'm satisfied. The file size counter has stopped rising and I think I've got everything. I return to the options switch auto scroll off because that allows me to slow back up slowly and make sure but on the way I notice um, constant dial arts revolving Google and catches my eye again so I hover over it I see it's got 1835 views four comments I decide to expand it click to play the video Back in the profile, I see a work I like by RTV Akant. I hover over it, click, and tab through the stack of images. I look at one more post, something I liked um, from Zach Blatt again. And then I hover over the capture button to click stop. Okay. Now we're moving into the, the review phase. Here is the curator's view of the collections index page. I have 61 minutes, 22 seconds to do something with this collection. Login is optional, but if you sign up, you get five gigabytes of free storage on Ryzen server. To make it permanent and stable, I decide to log in, entering my details and giving my collection a name. Signing in. These are my collections. You can see in the header that I've got 24 stored here on Rhizome's server. I'll scroll through the alphabetical list to find today's demo collection, Rhizome's website for DPC demo. Here's the collections index. There are 13 pages in my collection. They each have a time stamp detail detailing the date and the time of capture page title which is automatically extracted from the web and a URL. The capture browser is blank but I, um, I'm going to ignore that for the time being because um, 
don't want to get this too complicated, just show you what it is. So, using the tools from the left-hand panel, I can, so you can see there, clicking, I can create a new session, I can add a description, I can choose to keep my collection private or make it public, or I can use the option button with three dots again um, to open up a broader toolkit which will enable me to manage, upload, download, delete, etc. If I select one of the pages, I can view its properties, i.e. some basic metadata in the lower part of the left panel. Um, clicking plus in the central part of the left panel, I can create a list or lists to organise my collection. Perhaps I'll gather together the pages I've captured relating to constant dull art. I select two pages and drag and drop them into the list. There. Here are the pages within my list. An important thing to note is that lists are non-subtractive, so a page can be in multiple lists at a time and it doesn't, it doesn't disappear from the capture session, which you can see is still 13 pages on the left-hand panel. So 13 pages in total, two of them happen to be in this list. Um, I've added a very brief description. I decide to create a second list to collate the content I've captured about Zach Blass. Although I don't have a huge number of pages in my collection, I want to show you the full text search facility, which is in the top right. I'm searching for Zach. Select both pages and drag and drop them into my list. I can choose, back at the index again, I can choose any page as an entry point into my web archive. I click to review what I've captured. Notice that the capturing button, top left, is now in browse mode. I'm browsing a page I archived at 12.22 yesterday. I click to check all the elements of the article about Zach Blass have been captured correctly. I retrace my path of my clicks during capture, following the link to the NetArt anthology, making sure the video plays back, and clicking through to view the GIFs, still slowly circling. I wish I could see that. I will in a minute. Um, Oh, there's some texts about Zach Blast too. I didn't follow that link during capture, so this page isn't in the archive. Resource not found. I opt to patch, so try to patch. I opt to patch the missing page. If there's content missing which you realise you want, Web Recorder can patch your capture. Nicola mentioned this earlier. If the content is still um, is still there, um, it will um, web recorder will patch from the live web. Otherwise, it will um, or it can be imported from another public web archive, um, including the Internet Archive, um, using that Memento protocol. Um, okay. When the file size counter stills, hover over that patching button, so it's gone from browsing to patching to stop. I'm happy. I always want to review what I've captured from Instagram. I click on the RT Verkant images and scroll through the stack. I expand the revolving internet post, push play to make sure that it still does. Back on the profile, an Oliver Larrick work I'm fond of catches my eye, but I didn't expand this post during capture, so Web Recorder hasn't been able to archive the expanded image alongside its caption and comments. From options, top right, 
I can patch or just record this URL again. I capture it. Notice the button in the top left hand corner I'm now capturing again. I return to my collections index, it's there on the top of the list. I click, take a quick look and then use the internal link to return to Rhizome's profile. Oh, I really love that revolving internet video. Maybe I'll share it with a friend. <laughs> so I'll click on the share button top right, but my collection is set to private. I toggle to make it public and decide how I want to share the video before returning to the collections index. I click options, the three buttons, and select manage sessions. Here I can see an overview of my sessions. I can also delete or download my collection. I could also upload a work file captured at another time to this collection. Um, work being, as Sarah and Nicola have already mentioned, um, an ISO standard file format, meaning it's interoperable. So if I've captured a work file elsewhere using another tool, for example, archive it, I could upload it to the collection. Um, so anyway, I return to my collections index to consider, but choose to download my collection from the expanded options panel instead. So several options to do the same thing. Here I am. Third phase, browse. You can browse the web archives you've captured offline using the web recorder desktop player application. The latest release is available from GitHub. And you can see the link in the, um, in the address bar. I'll share the slides later on. So, um, so I launch the player and click open work file. Navigate to the place on my local disk where I saved my downloaded collection. It takes a minute or two. Here's my collection containing two lists. I click browse collection. Here's the collections index as a researcher or end user would encounter it. Again, I can choose any of the pages as an entry point into the archive. I select the sixth page in the list. Here's the article. I'll follow the link to the NetArt anthology again. I'll read a little. Then I decide I want to find out a bit more about the page I'm looking at, so I'll click the I information button in the top left corner to expand the collection navigator. Now I can orientate myself. I can see where this page fits within the context of the collection and view some metadata about the page and the capture. You can, you can, uh, you can contract the navigator panel or open it further if you want to. I just click the I button for a second time to close it and explore the page. Scroll down. Decide to click on the texts link, which I patched earlier. F I find the article I've patched. Scroll through, read a little, and then use my browser's back button to return to the NetArt anthology. Um, I click the GIFs to make certain they're still swelling. And scroll down to the social links. Click through to Instagram. Select a post to expand. I clicked on this one during the capture, so it's available for me to browse. Then another, which I didn't, so it isn't. The RTV account stack one, two, three. Okay, these examples help me to explain what I mean when I, or what I meant earlier this morning when I spoke about the object boundary, the browsable encounter is defined and delineated during capture, but if there is something um, 
you interacted with which was particularly difficult to capture or which you find doesn't render correctly when you browse, you can click to report a bug. So it's using the little insect, I think it looks like a ladybird icon, top right hand corner. So there. Um, lastly, I'd like to highlight the screencasts, user guide and the glossary available on Rhizome's website, guide.webrecorder.io. If you have any questions for now, we can talk them through, or questions for later, you could contact support at webrecorder.io to reach the whole team. Or if you have questions about potentially using Web Recorder in your institutional setting, you could write to Anna Parici. Uh, or if you feel there's something that I could help you with, you can get in touch with me. So this leaves us, I think, about enough time, I hope, because I started 10 minutes after the time that I was allotted. <laughs> so <laughs> we have 10 minutes. If um, if you're up for some experimentation or discussion, I've got time for that too. Any questions for Anissa? She has extensively used this tool, so <laughs> she's a really good person. And, and in fact, she um, was involved in the development of this tool um, through a sort of collaboration with the developers um, based on the project that she used this tool for. So if you have any questions about what it does, how it can work, um, she's probably encountered the same question. Um, so I was interested in when you were patching mm -hmm. and then at another point you recaptured. What is the difference between patching and recapturing? Well, I think... Um, I probably the I probably actually with the Oliver Larrick I probably should have just patched because I basically had I yeah. Instagram's a funny thing so as I demonstrated by that um, in the demo I believe that in order to be certain that I've captured all the content and and you can interact with it personally if I really wanted to capture that whole thing I'd click on every image and scroll through um, and you could do it sort of um, when you get when you get to this moment and um, you know you literally click on that on this the arrows going off to the next post that would work as well I think but I'd be wanting to to expand yeah expand those those but I think the um, in the case of the Ol Oliver Larrick I was just trying to um, use a variant option but I probably should have just um, patched it because the the page had been collected, but there was a, a um, an element missing. Whereas if I'd clicked on an external link going to some other website somewhere, a URL I hadn't captured, then maybe that would be the time to click. Just record this URL again. Sort of start here. Um, I think there. I think they're interchangeable, but yeah, I always think patch is more like, um, yeah, a sort of just just patching up something that's almost there but not, and maybe recording is capturing something that's entirely not part of your archive. Okay, yeah, that's great. So yeah, that sounds good to me. That makes sense. Oh, thanks, Anissa. Um, I'm not, I don't think that Web Recorder supports. Um, mobile uh, recording or tablet recording no. but I think that Ilya had said to us that we could deploy it in the mobile emulation option mm. in our browser I think in Chrome there's a mobile uh, emulation option I just wondered if that was something that you'd looked at um actually no but yes indeed you can you can um so I I record um and I I skipped over it, so I was saying the, the, the column in the collections index where it says capture browser, there was no um, data, so I'd, I'd captured using my native browser, which is Chrome, or which I was using Chrome yet when I, when I made this 
um, capture, but I could have selected any number of, um, they call them pre-configured browsers, so they're um, effectively kind of um, emulated versions, so you could be using Chrome, but select to make your capture using Firefox, and I think actually Firefox, they've found, we found to, to be the most reliable in replay. Um, fewer, um, fewer bugs and fewer kind of um, missing elements. Um, but I, I didn't do that. And um, in some user experience studies I did in the summer, I found that um, it made it made replay very slow. So I, I haven't done that. But yeah, one of the when you're um, capturing in the browser on the web, um, yeah, one of the options I think is an Android um, mobile um, as a kind of pre-configured browser. But at the moment, you can't. You certainly can't access the content on your mobile. But no, it's not something I no, I didn't experiment with it. If that answers your question and not such a Hi Anissa. Um, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so the last workshop we attended at the VA yeah. um Dragon was there and he was talking about automated functions and stuff like that. So I was just wondering have you explored anything with more automation and stuff as well to collect content? Um, I haven't, but that's certainly, it is something that they are working on. Um, and so Web Record is a tool that has a, as you know, a kind of um, a really active and growing kind of community of users who are with their feedback and their um, experiences of using um, are able to feed back into the process of developing the tool and sort of support its evolution. And one of the things that the community have asked for are automation um, kind of capabilities. I think it's, my understanding is that those, um, those capabilities are still some way off. Um, from my point of view, however, I find the tool almost most interesting for its manual qualities. <laughs> um, and yeah, I find it, um, and, and when I first began working with you and your colleagues at the British Library, it was um, the complement of these two approaches that seemed to be most productive. Um, thinking about the way your um, infrastructure enables you to ca ca collect at scale, whereas um, this tool allows us to um, hone in in a much more in a much more um, kind of uh, detailed and in-depth way, and and as I said, to have the opportunity to capture objects that are have a much more complex structure in terms of their distribution. So automated features, yes, on the way, not something that I have experimented with or am um, particularly wishing for. Okay, maybe time for one last question uh, before we take a break for more coffee and biscuits, but no vegan biscuits. Hi. Uh, despite the fact that it seems to be very manual and, and not automated yet, you mentioned that there is an ins institutional contact. Does this mean that some institutions use it uh, at larger scale? Um, that there are institutions that use it. Sorry, I don't understand the question. Do they use it at, large Do they use it at larger scale? Because it it seems easy but very very manual. So if an institution uses it to build up a bigger um, um, web archive, 
I wonder how to do this, so this is why my question... I'd say not on a very large scale at the moment, no. Um, all on a kind of reasonably um, time-intensive, um, one-page-at-a-time scale. Um, although there are, I think there are some um, on... Um, there are some more ambitious... I mean, there are ambitious projects, um, ambitious conceptually and ambitious in scope. Um, but yeah, I think I think the tool as it as it currently is, it's it's very well suited to these, um, yeah, more um, sort of intentional and um, focused captures. Yeah, so thank you again uh, to Anissa for walking us through Web Recorder um, and everyone for your questions. And as just a reminder, Anissa has offered, if you want to poke around and actually click some things uh, in Web Recorder, uh, she's happy um, to go through that uh, on the next break. So we will reconvene in about uh, 22 minutes. Um, so if you want to grab a coffee, uh, stretch your legs, uh, maybe even get a little bit of fresh air. And then we'll come back for the last session of the day um, with Laura Rubel and Dan Kirscher, Kirschner? Kirschner, who is, um, at least Laura, currently watching us live um, on the stream. Um, so she's eager uh, to join us uh, and share their work at George Washington University's with Social Feed Manager. Thank you very much. See you soon.